There are a lot of basic farms that almost every single world should have at some point in time, and I want to run down what farms I think are essential for any given world. If not, just incredibly easy to set up and things that you should have in your world. Starting with some of the most basic farms, spider farms are incredibly appealing throughout every stage of the game. The appeal to this farm is how relatively easy it is to set up in comparison to a lot of more complicated things, as well as how well it benefits the team, and it should definitely be high up on your priority list. Spider drops are easily some of the most desirable things throughout the entirety of the game and are almost always in high demand in some way, shape, or form. Silk is used throughout the entirety of the game and it's basically a tax at a certain point. Sewing kits are easily the most requested items throughout the game, just because of how prominent things like tam o shanters, top hats, and umbrellas are, as well as thermal stones if you're not willing to pay the rock tax. Spider glands vary in usefulness depending on the character choice, but healing is healing, and if you can accrue a large amount of it, then it could help the local Warly, Wormwood, or any other character who has a harder time healing than average. Monster meat is a very useful food source if prepared properly, since it can be used as one big meat in the crockpot, making it great for recipes like honeyed ham, even a recipe like bacon and eggs. You can also go simple and just use it as meat for meatballs, but regardless of how you prepare it, so long as you don't result in monster lasagna, there isn't really a bad way to have these. Another big appeal if you're not big on using it in the crockpot is you could just hand it to birds, and birds will spit out eggs in a bird cage, which can be useful for other recipes if not just for filler. Overall, monster meat is pretty fine if it's in the crockpot and if it's used properly. Some of the most prominent options to set up these spider farms involve rabbits. If you have about six or seven rabbits around a single spider farm and you have that area loaded in, so relatively close to your base, the rabbits will constantly aggro onto the spiders, killing them on site. And if you set up enough rabbits, then you could just kill the spider queen whenever it spawns. And it is essentially just an incredibly hands-off farm. There's also the classic methods of just being able to kill the spiders yourself whether that be having an abigail or taking them down one by one. This is probably the least efficient method in my opinion, since it's just you going out and killing spiders. But hey, to each their own. Obviously I can't call myself a Winona main if I don't bring up what my preferred method is, and that is planting spider eggs out in the middle of a pier and then killing those spiders with catapult. This helps isolate the spiders so that they don't wander into your base. This farm's appeal also is that because it is with Nota catapults that have AoE, it is very easy to kill large and large quantities of spiders all at once. So in theory, you could get any large amount of spiders and spider queens and kill them with an indefinite scaling as well as giving the catapults a designated area to make it really easy to go in and out of this farm. Pig farms are similar in usefulness to spider farms in that they provide a good source of meat and they provide supplementary drops that are requested throughout most of the game. One pig house out in the wild is used for half a pig house, so it is worth smashing random loose pig houses that aren't in a desirable position. But keep in mind that other people want the pig skin for whatever they're using. So setting up this pig farm as soon as you possibly can is a pretty good idea. This is a large time sink because you have to go out of your way to get more pig skin and get more pig houses, but it is very worth it since this farm essentially replicates pig skin every couple of days. Pig skin itself can be used for tons of things and those things are very useful. Football helmets are excellent pieces of armor and are typically people's go-to, at least until it gets outclassed in late game by things like a Thulocyte crown, or if you prefer using it, body armor rather than head armor. Umbrellas are incredibly useful for spring and rain, since these things can provide the rain protection that you desperately need if you aren't with a Deerclops eyeball or an umbrella in some way shape or form. Big meat itself is also pretty nice for crockpot recipes such as honeyed ham, bacon and eggs, and so on. Overall, setting up a pig farm is incredibly useful to you and your team, as most any character. Your process for setting up the pig farm is going to be more or less the same. You typically want to have a bait pen with something that lasts a incredibly long time that pigs are attracted to, whether or not that be powder cake, which is made with corn, honey, and sticks in the crockpot, the fruit cake, 
which is dropped by random mobs on occasion during Winter's Feast. Winter's Feast can be toggled in the world settings as well, so if you really wanted to, you could go out, kill a bunch of things, get a handful of endless fruitcake, and then use that as bait. An alternative is also just using pigskin itself, because pigs do try to eat their own pigskin. But overall, you can't really go wrong with the powder cake, seeing as how it has an incredibly long spoilage time. But the basic idea is you're going to want to surround this bait pen with pig houses. They do have to be relatively close to each other, but the distance between it is relatively flexible, so you could have as many or as little as you want in one location. But occasionally you might want to set up multiple bait stations just to get more pigs around a certain area. If you're playing the character like Wurt, or if you're basing in the swamp for whatever reason, you could also set up a merm house or have a merm house nearby a singular pig in order to passively farm pigskin and meat in the same way that bunnies will farm spiders. I do have a pig farm design that I've set up as Winona that tends to work pretty well. The appeal to this farm is that it scales indefinitely, realistically, but the resource sink is incredibly high. However, the trade-off is the efficiency is also incredibly high. The basic idea is you just lure in pigs using a spider hat or a merm mask, or even better, if you're a character who already aggros pigs to you by default, then you could just run over, draw aggro, and then use catapults to deal with the pigs. Overall, it's not a bad method if you're trying to farm large and large quantities of pigs, especially on cooldown. The lure plant farm is something that I feel obliged to include, if only because it's incredibly easy to set up and doesn't require a lot of explanation. All you really need is a boat, and then you could just put lure plants down on top of that boat. Eye plants aren't going to spawn on the boat, which means you could just pick leafy meat for free. Not much to say about it, it's good, you should definitely set it up, definitely worth it. The pencil farm is easily the most involved, as well as the most costly. This farm can take upwards of a whole season to actually get set up, but once you do it, it is very worth it for what it provides you, as far as I'm concerned at least. Different designs exist, but in order to set up a pencil farm, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to outline a 7x7 square with statues. After that, you're going to want to put in the corners generators or generators, depending on what you prefer. Then you're going to put two catapults on each station away from the statues. I would recommend you put a fire pit down here just to be able to cook some things later on. Having a birdcage in this pen is also a very good idea. Putting a lightning rod just for insurance is always recommended. And putting a scarecrow down will help spawn canaries, which will be important for down the road. Once you have all of that set up, you're going to want to swap to Wickerbottom and read a ton of Birds of the World and Sleepy Time Stories in that order. Then you're just going to whack them with your choice of weapon. I would recommend a golden axe because it just has to cross the 25 damage threshold in order to kill a bird. And the axe has high, high durability. As you're progressively killing canaries, this will give you morsels and gold feathers. Depending on where you put your scarecrow, you will also get crows, which will drop black feathers, which are very good for pencils. Now you're gonna wanna kill tons and tons of these over and over again. So it's a good idea to have about 10 of each book just to be able to capitalize on this farm to the best of its ability. Now keep in mind that is the minimum. You can have more if you want. What this is going to do is it's going to spawn Crampi for you. Those Crampi are going to be easily killed once you have the generators powered. But you don't want to have the generators powered until after you're at a good stopping point for the birds. Because otherwise there's a chance that the Crampi are going to steal the charcoal and the monster meat that the other Crampi dropped and you want to avoid that to the best of your ability. So what this farm yields in is morsels for years. The amount of morsels that you get by running this farm for about two or three in-game days is easily enough to supply you for an entire in-game year, if not significantly longer. So you're going to want bundling wrap to preserve all of this unless you're using it for rot. This also provides you with feathers for electric darts or for feather pencils. Killing the cramp eye is gonna provide you with charcoal and monster meat the monster meat is enough to supply you for months, however it is less than the morsels, but it is still a amazing amount of charcoal and monster meat for what you get. I guess you also get like a Krampus sack from this or something, like a, you know, the cramp I sometimes drop Krampus sacks, which are like... You know, I, I guess you could kind of benefit from it, you know, since it doesn't have a movement speed decrease, 
Uh, it has a bunch of slots in it. Uh, it never burns. You know, it's resistant to wetness or whatever. That's not the point. The point is, this pencil farm can set you up with pencils for years. Really good for designing your base and really good for setting up mini signs. Anemones is a very underutilized item that you need to start making use of in one way or another. Anemones give you a quick and simple rundown of what they do in effect, not in actuality, because in actuality they're a little more complicated. Anemones are perfectly capable of killing things when they're off screen or unloaded, which means you're able to farm things while not even being present, which includes, but is not limited to, Volt Goats, Mactus, Clockworks, and an even Ancient Guardian. These are very useful, but very limited in quantity. So use them wisely and use them sparingly. The basic idea of how you want to get these things set up for things like Mactus or Clockwork is you want to find out where they spawn, which Mactus is pretty easy. Clockworks are a little more tricky. I would recommend using Moggles or something that allows you to see where they are in the ruins. Make note of where they spawn, so keep your eyes on it go over, kill them, and then you want to place the anemones slightly off-center of where the clockwork spawn. This is very tricky to do if you're not well practiced in it, so don't feel bad if the anemone gets dug up the next time you do it. Theoretically, this could be used to clear out the ruins, even if you don't kill anything yourself. So anytime you kill Fuel Weaver to reset the ruins, those things are just going to tick down the clockwork over and over again until they die. Same thing with Ancient Guardian. If you find out where Ancient Guardian spawns, you can put down an enemy nearby, he dies to it, you walk over, don't even have to do the boss fight. If you're trying to automate Mac Tusks with an enemies, it's a good idea to just outline the Walrus Camp with an enemies. Just because Mac Tusk has some weird properties where he spawns anywhere around that structure, but it is a very good way of freeing up time in winter. The big appeal to automating Mactus, for me at least, is once I have a walking cane and a tam, I typically don't go out of my way to kill Mactus on cooldown. So having an enemy there is another way to just passively get those items. It's essentially just carrying a weight off your shoulder. Volt Goat farms are a little more involved in setting them up with an enemies. I would recommend looking up a guide because there are plenty of amazing ones, such as... Blacknish Monsters Automatic Volt Goat Design. Overall, lots of people talk about this concept of automating Volt Goats with anemones, but limiting yourself to only Volt Goats with anemones is not really something that I think people talk about enough, so it's definitely worth mentioning how useful anemones are in different regards. The Shadow Piece Farm is probably one of the strongest farms in the game, if only because of how impactful it is throughout most of the game. Nightmare Fuel is always a very sought after resource, and the Nightmare Armor and Dark Swords are probably the biggest Nightmare Fuel sinks in the game, so why not just get all of the above? This farm is somewhat finicky and requires a boat, some rocks, and your choice of gunpowder or catapults, as well as a statue material that isn't glass. Do note, you cannot use glass for this farm. The way you go about setting it up is you have two of the three shadow pieces, specifically the Rook and the Bishop on mainland, and you have a boat just off the coast of the island. You're going to want tons and tons of the knight statues on the boat, essentially however many you want to invest or however many you can fit. So what you're gonna do is you're going to proceed with the fight as normal and kill the bishop and the rook in whatever order you want, which is going to cause the knights to go to tier three. That is when you blow up the gunpowder or use the catapults to kill the knights eventually. This is gonna result in all of the knights dropping all of the same drops, that being nightmare fuel, dark swords, and Knight Armor, as well as another Shadow Atrium. Setting up this farm with large quantities of Knights means that you're very rarely gonna have to worry about Nightmare Field, Dark Swords, Knight Armor, and you're also not gonna have to worry about killing the Shadow Pieces in order to fight Field Weaver because you already have a bunch of Shadow Atriums stocked up. I personally use this as a prerequisite to fighting Celestial Champion, just because in that fight, Dark Swords are the preferred weapon, as well as Knight Armor being very useful since you're fighting on the moon, and Celestial Champion inherently wants your sanity to be high. So having two things to offset that is incredibly helpful. 
I do want to have some honorable mentions slash PSAs on what I think other people should start setting up. Specifically, what people should set up so I don't have to. Definitely do set up bees. Bee boxes are easily one of the best sources of food because they produce large quantities of honey, which are very useful in certain recipes such as honey nuggets, honey ham, or even just taffy. It makes for good filler if it doesn't take priority on certain recipes. And on top of all of this, you could also just start eating the honey raw for a pretty respectable approximate 10 hunger and 3 health. Which doesn't sound like a lot, but considering you get 7 pieces of honey per every one bee box, you're gonna have tons and tons of healing, especially compounded with the fact that it takes a long time to spoil. I see a lot of people making a big deal out of Wickerbottom farming with her new book, but I never really saw that as a very efficient way just because of the cost. However, it does yield in a large amount of fish, which like, that can't be denied. However, if you're looking for a good source of fish and meat that you could do on cooldown with very little prep, look no further than work. Merm farms are very useful sources of fish and meat. If you or somebody else on the server is work, they can easily set up farmable merms in the same way that you would set up something like a pig farm. It feels a little weird to bring this up in the video, but friend Katome was telling me that she wanted more people to start doing this. So I'll just bring it up. Start planting grass tufts and twigs at base. Like, ju just start getting that set up, because it's really useful to have those things. You always want those things. J just start doing it. You know, I'm, I don't want to be the only one setting it up. Katome doesn't want to be the only one setting it up. You guys don't want to upset Katome, right? The Berger Moonrock Farm is something that you definitely want to get set up in your worlds. The only requirements are you need the moon pedestal, a lure plant, at least one moonrock, and bait. And you also have to keep in mind that you do not need to bring any honey, otherwise it will aggro Berger and ruin the entire farm. The basic idea is that you want to lure Berger to get stuck between the pedestal and the lure plant. After you do that, he's going to destroy the pedestal constantly over and over, regardless of how many times you build. The benefit to this is you have a chance of duplicating Moonrock per each build, which means that you essentially get infinite Moonrocks out of this one farm. I would recommend you bring the Bee Queen Crown with you just to deal with Berger's sanity loss because he has an insane sanity aura, and just having something like a Tam isn't going to help you out with offsetting that. This game is full of different farms and different methods to deal with basically the same problem, so I would highly recommend you keep your eyes peeled just to see what other people are doing, taking their ideas and then building on it yourself, or just implementing them in your own playthrough. Don't Starve is a very complicated game, it is chock full of a bunch of different information and different techniques and different exploits, things of that nature, so definitely keep your, keep your ear to the ground, you know, keep your eyes peeled. I hope this was at least somewhat useful in knowing what to prioritize in regards to your farms, even if you already knew all these things. But that's all I really wanted to talk about, so until next time, buh bye bye